Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Fun and Games Podcast. I'm Jeff Moonen. And I'm Matt, a.k.a. Stormageddon. And you're listening to episode 63. And this episode, uh, we wanted to talk about something that it's been going on for a little while in gaming, and it's also a chance for Matt and I to toot our own horns a little bit. Uh, talking about the the phenomenon of watching other people play games that you don't even know. The uh, I mean, mostly streaming, but there's been less plays for years, and just, you know, the whole thing about games is playing them. Why do we want to watch them? Yeah, I thought it would be interesting. I mean, Jeff is not wrong. A part of this is because both of us have started streaming again more regularly and mm-hmm. more on that later in the episode. But part of it was also like talking to other people. I have friends who have never liked watching anyone else play games. They want to have the controller. They want to be in control all the time. Mm-hmm. We all know those people, and those people are lovely, and they can enjoy games the way they want. But I've always been a person who... If the game is interesting enough, if I am having enough fun with the, my friend, uh, if the, you know, the interactions are engaging enough, I'm perfectly happy to watch games. Uh, I many times on this podcast have talked about how I have only played the first Five Nights at Freddy's, but I've seen all of the games that have come out until this point because. So many YouTubers have played them. I started by watching Markiplier, but I don't really watch him that much anymore. But I've been obsessed with Matt Pat's theory exploration on game theory of the lore in those games because it's so well hidden. Oh, yeah. And and a lot of that just came from wanting to not... I, I am a coward. I <laughs> am the most cowardice coward. And so playing horror games for me, it was always like it was a better communal experience because... I tried playing the Resident Evil remake on GameCube many years ago. Mm -hmm. Right before the first puzzle, I got scared so shitless, I had to return the game the same day I rented it. Oh, jeez. So uh, horror games is what brought me to realize that I liked watching that kind of stuff with other people. And it's just kind of grown from there. Mm -hmm. My fondest memories growing up, and I must have told this story on the show before, but I'll do it again, is playing Resident Evil 2 with my friend Matt Karen because... He is great at survival horror games. I am not. But that game was scary enough for both of us. But because we were in the same room together and witnessed the jump scares together, the creep together, it made the game palatable for me, a coward, when someone twice my size who was also scared, it comforted me Uh, (laughs) Oh yeah, in a weird way. Yeah, I definitely feel like horror games have, I I don't want to say like always, but they definitely engender that sort of communal uh, sharing, you know, a scary story is so much better when it's told. Uh, a, a scary experience is so much better when you can, you you both get more and less scared when you're around those people. Um, I, I can think of two separate scary games that I remember that I played with my friend Sean growing up. And they were ones like, I, one of them uh, was Silent, Silent Hill 2. I can't remember if he had just gotten it or if we had rented it or whatever, but playing through that, neither of us had played through the first Silent Hill and so just generally having a mix of, well, that's weird. What that? What's with the weird, creepy kids following me? What's with the shadows? Okay, that's weird. Okay, you know, we're, we were teenagers trying to laugh it off, but also just both being freaked the hell out about it. But the one that always sticks out for me was when we rented Eternal Darkness Sanity's oh, Requiem for the GameCube. Oh, yeah, that game. One of my favorite horror games, just top to bottom. And... It having such a good time, uh, like we rented it at Blockbuster and just stayed up playing it. And it was maybe around one thirty or so. We were starting to wind down. Uh, Sean was gonna crash at my house, and we were just gonna kind of whatever. And then we got to the bathtub scare, mm-hmm. and I won't spoil the bathtub scare, but if you played the game, you know exactly which one I'm talking about. And both of us just kind of we didn't scream, we didn't freak out. We both just kind of went, we're good for another hour, right? Yeah, we're good for another hour. We could play for a little longer. We could play for a little longer. And yeah, that's right. yeah, it's, it, no, that's, and it's, that sort of experience is terrifying and creepy. And, and, and that sort of scare is great for someone playing all by themselves, but getting to revel in that shock and surprise with somebody else is something truly special. And I think that's another reason why horror games engender their, themselves to this sort of experience because it's great to like get to find the surprise or unwrap the the new twist with other people. You know, it's it's 
why the idea of like not spoiling movies is so prevalent these days. But horror games are some of them like their stock in trade is knowing where the next twist is and getting to unearth that together. You know, getting uh, Freddy Fazbear, the Golden Freddy or any of them like jump scaring you like that's all we need to experience it at the same instant. And it's so much better for it. Yeah, totally. And it's funny you mention uh, Eternal Darkness because also uh, same thing with my friends Brian and Joe. Like we had many a late night session with that game. And I remember, so for those who haven't played this game, although I'm pretty sure we've talked about it before, there's an ins- a sanity meter. And as the sanity meter goes down, things start happening to mess with you, the player, and the character. And one of the ones that I remember most fondly back in the CRT TV days mm-hmm. is one of the back in on those old TVs, if you never had a CRT is when you would adjust the volume, it would usually say in bright green letters volume and then like bars that would go up or down. Yeah. This insanity meter prank would do that. And I remember sitting with my friends, Brian and Joe and Brian elbowing me in the ribs and go, dude, you're sitting on the remote again. I'm like the remotes on the table. And then all of us are like, what? Uh, (laughs) Yeah, Pretty pretty much. Like out of an episode of Scooby-Doo. It was really funny. Fuck. We're haunted. Yeah. Like, uh oh, what happened? Wait. Or the corrupted save file. Like, oh, Oh, did you mean to delete your save? Deleting now. And you're like, no, no, no. Yeah. Or the one where you'd finish one chapter and it would act like that was the end of the game and you'll finish the story in the sequel coming in two years. Yeah. Which all uh, all sorts of stuff on them, I guess. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. And like, I think that what's really interesting about watching other people play games is I think there are certain games that are better for that kind of experience, but it also kind of goes back to the era of the arcade game. Like Mm -hmm. think about fighting games and people gathering around a popular fighting game with quarters on the screen and watching the other people compete while you get ready to step up. Same with um, DDR, which you are no stranger to, like standing by the side, waiting to get your turn. But in the meantime, you're watching the people compete. You don't just like kind of wander off. You stay there and watch and see what they're up to and, you know, how good they play, what song they pick. Yeah, sometimes you would, uh, someone would pick a song that you're still trying to get better at or even beat. And there, there, it wasn't a rare thing for someone to be standing nearby or, or, behind the machine to watch the steps and almost and be doing them on the floor you know uh-huh. to be to be stepping the same relative thing to try to get the the moves down like that wasn't everybody and every time but it was no it was a communal experience some people would go up there and do the song like some would g- just go to play to play the songs they like or to challenge themselves some picked songs that they could full combo which is to say they missed nothing they didn't miss a single step and didn't and like they even got a high enough rating on every step or what i would usually do which was freestyle which is um picking easier songs which gave you more time to do weird flashy moves and there was a bunch of us that did that too and it was and i i definitely saw people doing the whole fighting game thing but it was more ddr but yeah it, it's a uh, very communal thing and i i i miss that definitely that one ddr i have the pads at home but it's just not the same sure for sure and and i miss it too and i think that's what inspired me to start streaming not to like get all high and mighty like this is why i do my art but you know mm-hmm. the idea of streaming what led for, bled over from missing playing games with my friends and part of that is friends of mine have moved away over the years mm-hmm. we all lived in the same area and as people grow up they move to areas that are better for their career better for their life marriage kids whatever whatever it is And so you don't play games together as much. Now, thankfully, because of something like Discord, I talk to a lot of my friends pretty regularly, but we don't always play the same games together. And a lot of that core group, when we did play games together, it was mostly MMOs, Mm -hmm. large scale stuff that we could play together. It wasn't the couch co-op stuff that we grew up playing or even single player games. And so I have trouble playing games by myself now, which sounds so silly. But unless I'm really into a game or really obsessed, if mm-hmm. I'm just kind of viewing my library, I tend to not want to play anything because I'm like, well, I'll just be sitting here by myself playing a game. Um, but streaming again has made me want to reapproach gaming in a different light. And why I've mostly been streaming Super Nintendo games lately is because it's fun to dive into shorter games 
and play them with people watching and talk about those games. Oh, yeah. That's what I miss a lot about single player couch surfing with a friend or several friends is the interactions that would happen as a result of the thing you were enjoying. Sort of like MST3King any bad movie. It's the same idea. This idea of just engaging with a piece of media and interacting with it in ways that may be weren't even intentional when the thing was created. Yeah, it's I mean that's certainly why I do some of the streaming that I do. I've been playing slowly playing through Final Fantasy Seven. Because it's a game that I know very, very well. And so I can speak intelligently on it while only paying half attention to it. So it's good for holding conversations. But I've been thinking about it while playing through it. And thinking about which games I want to play next. And yeah, it, it causes you to reevaluate your your library, your history, your interaction with your, your playing with playing. And I think something that I'll probably do next is something that I, one of the two games that I got at the same time, I got Final Fantasy VII for Christmas in 1997. I also got Crash Bandicoot 2 and Star Wars Masters of Tarascazi. And I may, uh. and I may as a palate cleanser after I finally beat Final Fantasy VII, do a stream of Star Wars Masters of Tarascazi and talk about everything I know about that game, and we will all suffer together. Uh if if you would like a partner to beat up in a scenario like that, I would be interested in revisiting that game, mostly because I don't think it could possibly be as bad as I remember it, and somehow yet I believe it must be. Oh yeah, it's it's a it's abysmal. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be so uh, fun. Well, yeah, and I find also with watching streamers as I've become more common doing now that I've befriended quite a few of them. Um, again, mm -hmm. shout outs to the melting pot, which we are both a member of here, here. Um, like engaging with other people's nonsense as it were while they play these games is a lot of fun. Like I have never had any interest in dead by daylight. I think it's a great concept for a game. Mm -hmm. It looks like it's fun, but it's not for me. However, watching uh, my friend diehard diva play it and like lose her shit as she's about to die as something's chasing her down is a lot of fun mm -hmm. and not a thing that I would do, but is fun to observe. Um, oh, yeah. I think what what's really crazy about streaming and Let's Plays and the kinds of things that are fueled by gamers watching gamers or even non-gamers watching gamers is this way to access something that you don't think you otherwise would be able to. Mm -hmm. And also, it's a great way to get a preview of something like you might be interested in playing. Like before I bought Fire Emblem, I watched someone play fire emblem and i was like this looks really cool i've already heard good things about it all right hell i'm gonna pull the trigger i'm gonna buy this game and honestly we we kind of need that now because as games are more and more uh, on a digital storefront so returning the game because you didn't like it or it wasn't working for you or you finish the game and you go well i don't need this in my collection anymore let me give it to somebody else kind of uh that 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 goes away and so being able to watch somebody else play it, whether someone whose taste in gaming you uh, you, you sync with or uh, seeing somebody play it well or or whatever, or just see what the conversation is, is what you need. to Like more than reading a review of the game, you get a chance to see it in action. I mean, that's how a lot of games that we got as kids. We would, you know, of course, we'd see a cool box or we'd read a cool review in a gaming magazine or whatever. But a lot of times you'd go to a friend's house and they'd be playing it and you're like, all right, I want this game. I need this game. That was how I got into Katamari Damashi because my friend Ryan Joya was obsessed with it. And rightly so. So it was a weird game he was playing. We're like, this is ridiculous. Oh, this is amazing. And then it became a thing. Sure. And, and I think also what's really key to this kind of growth and trend, because like Twitch is the most pervasive, right? There are others like it's Mixer one of them. And, yeah. I mean, people do YouTube, Facebook, uh, caffeine. Uh, there's a bunch of them. Right. But Twitter is the most well known to people who uh, Twitch is the most well known to those who don't necessarily stream because it's owned by Amazon. It's promoted everywhere. There are a ton of them, but I think what's important about all of these and what came before when it was just edited, let's play videos and things like that is this desire for community, but also them being built around community. Like I find 
that mm-hmm. the reason people love Game Grumps so much, especially the current incarnation with Aaron and Dan and Danny, is they're they're good friends. They're funny, but also they're genuinely excited to play the games they're playing, even if they're bad games, even if they're games they've never played before. Oh yeah, like, there's a gen genuine awe to it that's totally relatable. I think the reason their Goof Troop series is such a popular one that they did is just because of how how genuinely joyful they are about Goofy and Max, about that, like, the heritage of Goof Troop, which they were mm-hmm. both familiar with. Oh, yeah. And then that game and how it functioned as a two-player game. Yeah, no, any of those. Uh, I remember, I love watching uh, their playthrough of Kirby's Epic Yarn. If, mm-hmm. I mean, if only because of the fact that uh, it, when you press up on the on the control stick, Kirby and Prince Fluff would, like, look upwards. And if you do it real quick, it looks like they're doing, like, a little head nod, like a, hey, hey. And they ran with that. Like, they would just periodically stop what they're doing. Hey, what's up? Yeah. And just have whole conversations with, like, the head wiggles. They, they made impromptu machinima while playing, which is exactly the crap you do when you play games with your friends. And it's nice to be able to, yeah, the... They, their sheer joy in what they're doing, their enjoyment, their uh, enthusiasm, even for subpar games, just for the experience, exudes and it's infectious. And it it definitely has hit a chord, and I certainly like it. For sure. And I, and I think also, like we talked earlier with horror games and arcade games, like the kind of game I think translates as well. I mean, mm-hmm. we spent a whole episode last time talking about the goose and the untitled goose game because Mm -hmm. it not only was so pervasive and everywhere in social media uh, news articles tv like like everywhere so good it it, it's because it's the kind of game that is easy to share with someone else Mm -hmm. um as we talked about on the show my spouse sarah doesn't play a lot of games she mostly likes walking sims she mostly likes you know narrative focused stuff things that are really actiony uh, RPGs and some other stuff she tends to be less interested in because she doesn't care as much about the mechanics of the game. She's she a narrative person. The, she cares about storytelling. She's an actress and she's a writer. Exactly. So it, it makes sense. But when I got Goose Game, I showed her the trailer for it and she shrugged. She's like that seems ridiculous. But when I actually had it and was playing it, like she sat down next to me just to kind of check it out in silence and then slowly she was like Oh, we'll try to do that thing. If you do that, then maybe that'll work. And then, like, helping me solve the puzzles. And then, like, when we would accomplish certain things that made hilarity or chaos ensue, we both laughed so hard we were crying. And I think that kind of comedy in a communal experience, or at least that kind of um, puzzle solving, is really fun to jump in and is, is really fun to have and perpetuate streaming culture as well. Like when people play puzzle games or games with a lot of puzzle solving, like your Zeldas or your other RPGs, you know, or Portal, or like I said, Goose Game, Mm -hmm. it becomes really interactive because you want to help and you want to be involved. I remember I was watching Patrick Klepek's dream um super mario maker 2 which he's been doing for a while Mm -hmm. um he says it's his his daughter's college fund machine (laughs) um but like he will say he has a rule to not um theory craft he wants to figure out a a a stage he only will then ask for theory crafting he's like all right i'm stuck tell me your theories and then the chat will explode with like oh maybe try this my trip maybe try to do that Mm -hmm. and it's such a communal and interactive experience because like when we were sitting on a couch with a friend like a la eternal darkness like when you're trying to figure out the next area to go to or what the next thing you need to do is it becomes a communal effort because you all want to succeed together even if only one person's holding the controller yeah you sit there and you're like don't take the shotgun then the the room's gonna crush you you gotta put the fake shotgun back on the on the on the mantle you know or it's a Resident Evil puzzle or, or, or whatever it is. No, it, it's, you know, backseat driving, backseat gaming uh, is forever. And you no, know, you're right. It's another layer on top of how we interact with games, uh, a, a meta interaction. And I know meta gets thrown out, thrown around a lot, but it's an interaction beyond the interaction. But something like Untitled Goose Game or Mario Maker, those are games that for one reason or another, are also very easily conveyed. If you, I like, I don't want to go and watch someone play a MOBA. 
I'm not a big fan of MOBAs in particular. And those are the sorts of uh, games that you need to know deep to really enjoy it. You know, it, you, getting in on a surface level is difficult. And, but it is a genre that is filled with people that get that deep into it so it can have a good, well-retained audience. Something like Goose Game is designed to be, it's, it all serves the function of chaos. You are Goose. You honk, you flap, you distract, you steal. This all is very easily conveyed. And that's the point. And that's what makes it super easy to impose your own narrative on it, which is what a lot of us are doing. Like watching Game Grumps, what they do. What uh, any of us do when we MST3K a game. Any, anything like that. We are imposing a narrative on the game. Whether it's the one that the game has and we're matching it, or our own variations and headcanons and interpretations on top of it. Something like Mario Maker. Mario is like... Uh, it's one of the original languages of video games simply because it's one of the oldest. It's, it's, it's Latin, you know, so much is derived from its base tenses and infinitives, even if we don't always speak it that well. So you can have something complex like Mario maker two with weird ideas and everyone can get on board. And even if you can't get on board with the design, it's like, Oh, it's Mario. Let's watch these people do crazy things with Mario that I understand. And more and more games, and, and I love the fact that there are the overcomplicated games that people can get into. You know, you need to know the rules to Magic the Gathering if you want to watch someone stream MTG Arena. But, you know, you can watch anybody, you know, play a racing game or speed run something and just be like, wow, that's fast, that is. It, it's, it's, there's a lot of uh, cool areas to dive into. Yeah, I mean, with games done quick, to, to speak to speed running, like... That's not something I thought I would be interested in watching just because I'm like, okay, someone played a game quick. Um, but there's something to it, especially when you're like watching it live, like they were doing a version of it live with Mega Man games at um, MAGFest. Yes. And like as a fan of Mega Man, someone who grew up playing those games and loves those games, watching someone purposely hamper themselves in a certain way to speed run or just skip certain things like it's just a fascinating it's like turning the gaming experience itself into a puzzle even if it's not a puzzle game um i was yeah. watching someone um speed run the new Link's awakening and there's a there's a glitch where you get hit by a high high knocks in a certain way mm -hmm. that it pops you into the room at the end of the dungeon that you can just get the instrument without fighting the boss and i would have i like a one in a million chance, right? And I would have mm -hmm. never figured that out. But it was so cool to watch happen. Yeah, and a lot of speedrun, a lot of games that are speedrun have their own mini communities within the larger speedrun community. So rather than just when we were kids, if maybe there was a password or a code in, in Game Pro or EGM, uh, maybe we heard from someone else in the schoolyard about something, maybe we bought a strategy guide. But now we are able to not just share stories, but also in real time, watch things happen together while one person hammers away at it. And everybody tries it in different ways because there's also the showcasing of, to, to twist a little on the, on the, or pivot a bit on the speedrun thing, uh, tool assisted speedruns, which are essentially um, perfect plays put together that, you know, people will re record and re record frame by frame by frame to get like an optimal playthrough to show how quickly a game can be beat. Not everybody's into watching those, but speedrunners watch those. And it's like, oh, well, only a computer can do that right now. Let's see what we can do about making that happen. And we build and we build and we build and we communicate and we stand on each other's shoulders as we reach higher and higher. It's kind of remarkable to see. And, and speedrunning is one where, so my wife, Sarah, does not like watching anybody play video games <laughs> she is an older sibling and a str strongly one to the point where her little brother would be like hey do you want to get this game or we could get two controllers and play this game she's like no but if you get it i'll play it and then he would because he was just excited about playing with the sister and then she would play it one player and make him watch i'm calling my wife out here she she <laughs> Yikes. But no, and she freely admits to doing this to being like, no, of course. And 
so there's a lot of games nowadays that I know a lot about. I've never played. Um, Sarah's beaten every single Arkham game. I haven't. <laughs> so I've played some Spider-Man. She's almost done with Spider-Man. Um, she's the one that played through Kingdom Hearts when we got it on the PS4. I played through it some on PS2. And so I need to go back and play these myself because I love these games and I want to have the experience that I do where I'm much more of an uh, exploring probe everything. She's like, I want to beat the game. If there's, if there's side quests, no, she's absolutely a side quest hound. But I bring all of this up because the, like the idea of Twitch, she loves that we do it. She's like, that's perfect. You know, Jeff, that's perfect for you to do. Like, like Matt looks like he's having the best time. Like, that's great. I'm not going to watch your streams. I'm sorry. That's just this. That's not what entertains her. But games done quick. This is she's like, this is shit I could never do. And no one we know does. This is like this is a whole nother ridiculous art form with something I really like. That's different than, you know, sitting here on the couch watching somebody uh, stumble through trying to beat a level. They know what they're doing. And when they fail, it's because they are trying to soar without a without like without a plane. They're trying to fl- <laughs> they are trying to fly under their own power and succeeding. So the the sheer fact of the building of communities, the uh, the growth of accessibility as well as the deepening of niches allow for a great variety of social experiences. While we still are able to sometimes just sit on the same couch or sort of see each other's couches while we share the experience. Yeah. And I think also something that's key was key to my development as a gamer is I don't know that I'd be as into RPGs as I am now if I didn't watch someone else play them. Oh yeah. Because for me, like I love RPGs now and we talk about JRPGs quite a bit, Same, but my first JRPG experience, I was very late to the game was watching my friend Matt, who I mentioned earlier, playing Final Fantasy VII. He got this game. He was so excited about it, and I had never heard of it. So I sat and I watched him, and he played for hours and hours because Matt also, like I said before, someone who doesn't like to watch other people play games and still doesn't. Mm -hmm. But I watched him play so much of that game that for Hanukkah that year, I was like, Mom, Dad, I want a PlayStation. And I ne- like, I had a Super Nintendo. I was super satisfied. I might, might have dabbled with Chrono Trigger at that point, but like, I, I, hadn't re- I was still kind of coming into my own as a gamer. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't until watching him play Final Fantasy VII that I was like, that looks complicated, but I want to play it because I think I can do it. Mm-hmm. And fell in love with it. And then I went back and played tons of old Super Nintendo RPGs and older games. I still haven't played, and we've talked about this before, the full run of Final Fantasy games because I got into the series so late. But if it wasn't for sitting and watching him play for hours on end, I don't know that I would have loved Seven as much as I did and and do and have gotten into his RPGs as much as I had, if not for that experience. Oh, yeah. No, it's... Those sort of, like, you you can't duplicate those sort of experiences. They happen all the time. They are both super special and so commonplace because there are so many of us, there are so many games, there are so many, like, lightning-in-a-bottle moments that happen, and I love that. And, yeah, there's definitely games that I am lifelong, a lifelong fan of because my brother liked them, and I watched him play it. And every now and again, I could also play. Only if there was player two. <laughs> yeah, and I think my love of Luigi comes from being a player two. Same. I mean, you know, I mean, also Luigi's just the better character, let's be honest. Oh, yeah. He's got personality and depth. Mario's just the hero, but Luigi is suffering, and suffering is art. I'm sorry, that got away from me. It's fine. It's fine. We, I, I get it. I'm there. <laughs> but, like, let's focus in more on streaming for a minute and talk about how we both stream and while there's a lot of fun in streaming and there's mm-hmm. a lot of great things to it most of the pop culture universe knows streaming because of one name ninja and fortnite and twitch and mm-hmm. while he is a very specific case and honestly i have no ill will towards ninja i've i'm not a fan of his stuff because i don't play Fortnite. i'm not really into it but like Same. good for him that he's able to make a job out of this that's phenomenal right but that's not 
90% of Twitch. 90% of Twitch is people playing games to share their inner monologue out loud about that experience while engaging with other people. And I think it's also important to talk about how things like Twitch and Mixer and the like are not perfect platforms. There's a lot of advertising. It's a lot of focus on capitalism. And look, I, I, I know what this podcast is about. We're talking about video games and the experiences. But at the end of the day, video games are made to sell to make money. But that said, I feel like these kinds of platforms give a voice to people who don't necessarily care about the money side of it and care about the shared experience side mm-hmm. of it. While I am an affiliate at the moment and I can make some money from streaming, it's not a ton. And I think I continue to do it at this point mostly because I like the interactions I get with people who watch, whether they're friends I know or new newcomers to the stream. And while ultimately it's free advertising for those games, I think it's it's at least the most for the most part the most honest form of advertising like i said i bought fire emblem because i watched someone play it Mm -hmm. it wasn't just because i saw the game and went oh nintendo selling me a thing let me go buy it it's because the person who was playing it was so genuinely enthralled and excited about it that it was translatable and i immediately felt what she felt because she was so excited that's amazing and yeah and it's not just the I mean, I know like Fortnite is is one of those that's easy to, it translates well to something like Twitch because of the Battle Royale uh, model where you log into a game, you and 99 other people, and it's over within minutes and it's all kinds of crazy stuff. It There's a certain great chaos about that. But then there is also the, the sharing and the community building. Um, a game that wouldn't necessarily seem like it would uh, stream well, I remember uh, hearing about the streamer Little Sia. I think I'm getting that name right. Who streamed? He's I. I don't think she, I'm not sure she still does, but for a while she was streaming Let's Dance, mm-hmm. like for years. And it wasn't any sort of like I'm a professional dancer. Come look at how good I am. It's I just want to have some fun. And it became a thing after that, and it built, and it became a a bigger community, and it was a a, a sharing in. I don't know, enjoying the music and uh, that whole like it's it's the exact opposite of dance like nobody's watching. But for, for sure, but somebody is, but nobody is because you can't actually see them, but they're there. But, you know, they're there and the community's built. And it's a uh, I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah, I think also like. You know, we went to a panel together that that was I, I credit my inspiration for getting back into Twitch streaming uh, back at MAGFest back in January of 2019. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the streamers, uh, 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 Tanya, who I spoke to, um, who I'm blanking on her streamer name now, it might just be Tanya. Um, mm-hmm. But I asked her, like, if you're if you want to stream and you don't know what to stream or you don't feel like streaming, you know, how do you keep going? And she made it very simple. It was, you don't have to. There are no rules. Yeah. This is the Wild West. And while there are people like Ninja can't stream whatever he wants. Ninja right. has to stream Fortnite. That's what he plays and that's what everyone tunes in for. Mm-hmm. But I have a smaller audience. You know, consistency is important. But the fo- for the most part, like, it was made very clear to me that you should engage with people who want to engage with you however because they will meet you where they live if they care. If they right. don't, then they won't tune in anyway. But the idea is if you don't feel like playing a game, then don't. Just chat with them or play a different game or, you know, suddenly start streaming without any, without letting anyone know and see who t- turns up. Like, at the end of the day, you have to do it for you and why you want to do it. And right. I think that's important for the communal feeling of gaming too. The idea that if you're only playing a game to play with your friends because they like the game, Mm -hmm. that experience is never going to be fulfilling for you. It's why I tapped out of WoW Classic so quickly because I loved seeing my friends so excited to play this thing that we've all played together way back when. But when I got into the grind and it took me, you know, eight days to get 10 levels, I was like, I don't have time for this. I'm never going to play it. It's not worth the 15 bucks a month. Right. So I tapped out, but they're still having a great time. But I had to be honest with myself. I'm not going to keep playing this thing just so I can share in this communal experience. Because there's other ways to do that. You know, I can hang out with them in Discord while they're playing and I play something else. Um, Whatever it is. And I think that at the end of the day, if you're someone who likes to watch games, 
there's also no pressure for you to be someone who is watched. There's so much content out there and so many great streamers like myself and Jeff and Kippy Koshka and Dan O'Mac and tons, Die Hard Diva, tons of others. And those are just people I've interacted with personally. Mm -hmm. But it goes beyond that. Like there is content out there for you to consume. And if you just want to see certain games or what gaming is like or just hang out with someone who's really into what they're doing right there's a giant library to do it with which i think is really awesome yeah you can you can find new things find new people find old things and and uh like old forgotten experiences my ultimate goal is to get to stream game gear games because those don't get enough love and <laughs> that's the kind of thing where i know that doesn't have a huge audience but there's going to be some people who are super excited that that is going on. And I want to meet those people. And, for sure. For and, sure. and it's nice that that's out there. And whether it's Game Gear or a, a specific game series or a specific time period or whatever, you can find that. If you only want to play, you can play and share or uh, in a big way on Twitch or just amongst friends. If you only like to watch, that is still being part of gaming. Absolutely. There's absolutely no rule. It's why games lo like The Walking Sims came into existence. It's because it's essentially a watch narrative with minimal mechanics, but there's still an audience for that. Like, mm -hmm. we, and we've said this many times, but the bullshit that there's there are only certain types of gamers is nonsense. In fact, I even hate the term casual gamer. I get it, and it's not meant to be derogatory, but because in the industry it was treated treated so de derogatory. Mm -hmm. I think the term is just gamer. If you play games, you're a gamer. It doesn't matter whether it's a fighting game, a racing game, a walking sim. Uh, you know, how, however you engage with video games makes you someone who plays video games. You know, we don't we don't classify a person who likes to read as a reader or a movie watcher as that. Like, if you engage with the medium and you like the medium, you like it. That's it. And the gatekeeping is really dumb. And I think what's really great about Twitch and the like, the other iterations that are like it, is that you can engage with media that you might not otherwise engage with because you don't have to buy the $400 console, get really good at a certain game. You can just live vicariously through those who are good at those things or who are really into those things. Yeah, we, sh we share in the future, the present, and the past of, of all of this stuff. And... Yeah, we don't necessarily need to invest all the money for what is essentially like if if your optimal enjoyment experience of a game is seeing somebody else beat it, you don't need to spend all the money to make it happen. You probably already got everything you need to enjoy that experience. Just, you know, typing it into the search bar, which is That's great. True. I will admit that one thing about being able to get game capture and put gaming stuff on YouTube and other platforms so easily has been great for for me is looking up the endings to games I could never beat or games that I got bored of and couldn't finish. Um, <laughs> like with the recent Crash Bandicoot re-release. I love those games. Mm -hmm. They still sometimes get too challenging even for me. And so I beat the first one, yeah. but I just couldn't beat the second one. I couldn't get to the end. Mm. So I looked up the ending and then moved on to the third one. That's not a thing you could do 20 years ago. And I really appreciate that. Also, seeing the ending finally of the effing Ninja Turtles game on Nintendo, the first one, which I had never beaten. I couldn't get past I, I couldn't get past the damn level. A friend of mine got to the Technodrome and said, I'm done. And we're like, what are you doing? He's like, I can't beat it. I'm not even going to try. Mm -hmm. um, so I looked years ago, I looked that up on YouTube and saw the ending of that game, which, you know, is, is, is a Nintendo ending. It's, you know, pictures and scrawling text. But it felt good to see the completion of something that I could never get anywhere near. Oh, yeah. And that's the sort of game that I love watching somebody who's really good at the game play. Yeah. Some games are just fun to watch people play, be bad at, be good at, whatever. And then there are those ones where it's just... No one beats this game. You're going to speed run it? I want to watch. I want the catharsis of watching this thing get demolished. <laughs> and, yeah, for sure. And the first Turtles game is definitely a case for that. I, I, I recently acquired the uh, the cartridge for it. I'm, I'm going to attempt it. I'm not going to beat it. <laughs> but, you know, I remain hopeful. I mean, that's, I think, why I've had so much fun uh, streaming Super Nintendo games also is relearning that I was never excellent at those games. I'm, mm -hmm. I would call myself an averagely skilled gamer. There are some games I'm very, very good at, but for the most part, I'm an 
okay competitive player and I'm an okay gamer. I like games that kind of relent a little and let you see the story. Um, I don't mind challenge, but, you know, I also can't do Dark Souls. It's not for me. You're an enthusiastic gamer. Right. But that said, what's been interesting about replaying Super Nintendo games, especially before I got my uh, hashtag not an ad, 8-bit do, um, Super Nintendo replica controller. It's a controller mm-hmm. that looks like the Super Nintendo controller, but has analog sticks on it um, for the Switch. Like trying to play old Super Nintendo and Nintendo games with the Joy-Cons is not impossible, but it's definitely a challenge. And I died many a time mm-hmm. in Super Mario World 2 when I probably wouldn't have if I had a decent D-pad. Um, and so I'm looking forward to going back and engaging with those. But that said, also, older games were just harder because they thought difficulty equaled playtime, which is not necessarily true now. If I can get right. through a game in two hours and it's easy but a lot of fun, I'd probably play it multiple times. Right. Um, and, and so it's interesting to re-experience that playing Super Nintendo games and seeing just how terrible I am at some of those games that I have such fond memories of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, there was no actual point to that. I just felt like sharing. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's great. <laughs> It, it, it's good to these, and these are the things we're finding out because Matt, you and I both kind of went. All right, we're gonna stream games. Uh, do we need everything we need? Nope, we're gonna get started, and we'll find it out. We'll figure it out as we go. Pretty much, um, and like I've I've done one offs of games. Like I play, I think I did one or two streams of Fire Emblem, a sixty hour game for a couple hours apiece. But yeah. people hung out and nobody cared. So yeah, at the end of the day, you can stream more or less whatever you want right i I have i have a regular group of friends that come onto my stream and i'm very appreciative for all of them and but i don't think anybody is necessarily invested in having to watch my entire final fantasy 7 run from the beginning and frankly i'm just going to be happy when i can go a stream without my uh my ps3 controller um wigging out and (laughs) and it, it does this weird thing where just because it's windows uh, it seemed I had to download a driver that fools the computer into thinking it's a an Xbox 360 controller, oh, yes. mm-hmm. which which usually works. And because look, I could just plug in an Xbox 360 controller, but it's a PlayStation game, and I have standards, um, <laughs> or, or just rather I have sense memories, and it makes more sense to me. Sure. But it will occasionally just start um, randomly inputting all sorts of buttons at once. Yeah. So it'll usually end up putting me into the menu. And then it'll just like scroll through. Maybe it'll make some selections. I definitely lost a couple of elixirs last run. <laughs> oh, it is no. it is what it is. But you know, as soon as I can uh, get through a stream without doing that, you know what? I will be sore and high. I will have completely made it, no matter who's watching. Yeah, I I uh, speaking to uh, controller bullshit for just a moment. I bought a Bluetooth receiver for my PC so I could use mm-hmm. my PS4 controller. Yeah, half the time it doesn't work, half the time it desyncs. So today, for sixteen dollars on Amazon, I bought an Xbox 360 wired controller, so I don't have to deal with that BS anymore. Mm-hmm. I just had had enough, and I'm like, most of the buttons are mapped to Xbox because it's Windows and Steam follows Windows. Like it was very yeah. confusing when I played Devil May Cry Five mm-hmm. to use a PlayStation controller, which is PlayStation is what I played Devil May Cry on. Yeah. But with all the buttons in the menus saying the Xbox buttons. Now, it's positioning, and if you can remember it, you can remember it. But right. there was, like, a two-hour window when I first started playing where I was like, oh, the X button. Oh, no, not that, that like, the actual X button, not the X button that would have been the Y button, you know, things like that. Yeah, um, I, I know exactly where the PlayStation buttons are, are set up. Like, I can do that with my eyes closed. Uh, Nintendo, I'm okay. Xbox, I'm completely lost. So if I'm playing a PlayStation game on an Xbox controller, I know those symbols. But if you give me Xbox prompts, oh, I am, uh, I'm, 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 I'm hunting and pecking on that keyboard. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think for me, it's because I played on my PC for so long and had used Xbox controllers until recently. Mm -hmm. I think it's just what I'm used to. But that said, that there is some stuff lost in the translation. We're completely oh, definitely now. But it's okay. We're we're discussing our streaming experience. (laughs) Right. When I bought Final Fantasy VII for the fourth time on the Switch on sale, in my defense, um, playing it with the Switch controls, but. 
like thankfully because it's a port like they say the cor- corresponding buttons it's not like they don't have the playstation buttons it does have the switch buttons but sense memory is like messing with me just a little bit because i'm like all right so it's the circle button for this but oh no i mean the b button no no i mean the a button like you know oh yeah just, you're used to whatever controller you use the most is what you're used to for console gaming for the longest time i was used to the Xbox controller because I had a PC and a 360 and the Wiimote was unlike anything else in that generation. But now that I have the Switch, which is similar, like all of it just gets mixed up in my head depending on what platform I'm playing on. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny. Uh, I I was thinking that maybe uh, for an episode I wanted to talk about uh, controllers and controller feedback because the announcement about the PS5 controller. I mean, we, we, uh, I mean, we could do this now. No, no, th- th- this is a nice, uh, maybe we'll do that next episode. That's, that'll be a nice transition. Yeah. But, um, no, I, I think, I, I think we've explored the, the, the topic of a shared experience. Um, I mean, we've talked before, like we talked at, uh, a, a video game con about like the games that we want to, we wish we could share with the world and streaming is a great way to do that. And I don't, I don't know. I think talking about our controller experience and, and, uh, kvetching about the, our stream setup is a nice we, we don't need to necessarily ask each other this episode. Like, you know, what's your favorite? Like, we're, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm just excited that all of this is going on. I'm just happy to be here. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, I, I think that at the end of the day, if, if you're someone listening who is interested in streaming, and by God, me and Jeff would never even begin to claim to be professionals. Um, but my be- best advice to you is what was given to me, which is just do it, which is how this podcast started. It's how any of the 18 projects I'm working on at once get started. It's if you want to do a thing, just do it. There are a ton of rules and a ton of layouts and a ton of different things to set up and do. But at the end of the day, once you start doing it, the other stuff falls into place. And the act of doing and accomplishing will make you want to do it more. Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, if you're someone who likes sharing gaming experiences with other people, reach out to those people. If you're friends with someone who you don't hang out with enough and they really like X game or Y game, say, hey, do you want to hang out and do this thing or I'll watch you do this thing because I want to know more about it? Like, mm-hmm. get involved. It's not that hard. And... Yes, if you're someone who happens to not like watching games, then ask to play something with someone or reach out to a creator online and say, hey, I like the stream you did. You know, do you have any recommendations for X, Y or Z? Um, Because at the end of the day, it's a community and that's what we want to continue to build both with this podcast and just in general in the the world of gaming. Yeah, no, it's uh, Twitch streaming and Let's Playing and all of this is just a greater part of sharing the community and interacting with it in the way that you find the most fun. Cause at the end of the day, that's what it's about fun. And yeah. I yeah. Mean, that's, that's why we called this podcast, what we called it. Damn right. <laughs> so, but yeah, let us, let us know, uh, what are your favorite streamers to watch? What are your favorite games to stream? If you stream, what, uh, how, what are some of your favorite, uh, couch co-op moments, you know, sharing uh, a game with friends or, you know, do are you okay watching someone else play games or do you have to play? These are these are strong opinions. We like to know about them. This is a yeah. conversation. Thank you for being a part of it. I'm Jeff Moonen. I am Matt AK Stormageddon. And happy gaming. <laughs>